All right. If we're all grabbing a seat there, then I'm going to ask for a volunteer to open in prayer if someone is willing. And if no one is willing, then I'm going to ask Vern if he would be so kind. Amen. All right, we finished paragraph for section 4 of chapter 8 last week, so we're going to pick up in chapter 8 in section 5, which is on page 25 in your booklet. And if anyone is needing booklets, I think we just replenished booklets in the back And as well, we got the May and the June table talks both this last week. So if you're using those devotionals, they are on the back there and gladly grab for the next two months. All right. Chapter 8, section 5, on page 25, says, The Lord Jesus has fully satisfied the justice of God, obtained reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those given to him by the Father. He has accomplished these things by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he once for all offered up to God through the eternal spirit. And so again, we'll break this down in small pieces and look at the scripture passages uh, accordingly. So the first clause here, the Lord Jesus has fully satisfied the justice of God, obtained reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those given to him by the Father. And we've got two passages here. Who wants to take John 17, verse 2? Tim. And who wants to take Hebrews 9, 15? Howard. Okay. So whenever you're ready then, Tim, go ahead and read John 17, 2. Okay, and maybe, do you want to add verse 1 there, just for a bit of backdrop? Okay, so this is the beginning of Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is an important prayer as Jesus is approaching his final days. Uh, and it's an intercessory prayer, that's why it's called a priestly prayer, because priests intercede on behalf of the people. And so Jesus is filling his priestly role here, praying for those. And we've discussed this in the past, how very often, especially, I mean, it's everywhere in the Gospels, but especially in the Gospel of John, where you see the the most explicit Trinitarian theology, where, where Father and Son and Spirit are all doing things in connection to one another, right? So... Uh, The Father is glorifying the Son so that the Son may glorify the Father. And the Father gives the Son authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So the Father gives a mass of humanity to the Son. The Father gives authority to the Son. And there is a mutual glorification between Father and Son. And so hopefully we're seeing a strong pattern of how Father and Son are united on the same mission, even though their work isn't identical, their will for what ought to happen is perfect, perfectly united. They, they share one will. There is one divine will that they are working out together. Uh, and then the Spirit also is coming later on, uh, not in terms of his existence, but in terms of his explicit statement of his work. Discussion on this. Does this make sense? Okay. And this is always an interesting point for discussion, but notice closely 
who receives eternal life. And later as we go through the, the priestly prayer here, Jesus is quite explicitly not interceding for everyone who has ever lived. Okay? If Jesus had made atonement for everyone who has ever lived, and he is interceding for everyone who has ever lived, who is in heaven? Everyone. Is everyone in heaven? No. Has the Son made satisfaction for every last person who has ever been born? No, he is not. Is he interceding for everyone who's ever been born? No, he is not. Okay? His atonement is perfect. Those whom the Father has given him are atoned for, they're interceded for, and they will make it all the way home. Hebrews 9.15. Howard, you had that one. Very good. Okay. So again, there's a shift in covenant eras uh, because Christ's atonement has taken place in history. So in the Old Testament, we have the promise of what's to come. And in the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, we have the new covenant being officially established. Okay. So this is when it actually happens that we move into the new covenant era. Okay, so the new covenant is planned from eternity past. It's promised, and, and that's why we have all these types and shadows of priests and prophets and kings helping us to get a picture of what this new covenant is going to be like. But the new covenant is not actually enacted or established until Christ completes his work uh, on earth. Um, and now we are in a new era. Uh, so... How were saints saved in the Old Testament? There's no new covenant until Christ. But what was that? By faith. By faith in? Yeah. By faith in the promise, right? So they saw dimly what we see clearly. They saw the promised Messiah. We see Messiah from our vantage point of history, which is much better, much clearer. Um. The Old Testament saints were saved by faith. And we could even do one better and say they were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And even though they didn't know Christ by name, they knew the promise of Christ. And so uh, the language that's helpful is often that they were, uh, in some sense, kind of saved on credit. They were drawing on the line of credit before the money was deposited. And now in time, Christ deposits that. Uh, but it is applied to the Old Testament saints as well. Jolene. The blood of the lamb or the blood of the lambs they were sacrificing? Okay. Hebrews would say that the blood of bulls and goats can't save. They can save typologically, right? They can save symbolically. But God's uh, willingness to forgive is not based on the blood of animals. It's based on the blood of Christ. So I'd say there's a typological salvation there. There's a pattern of life that's helping these people to understand what the Messiah's work is going to be like. He's going to be a flawless, perfect lamb who gives his blood for the sins of the people. So it's a role play to help them understand but no forgiveness is actually enacted by that. It's, the, it's a promise of what's going to happen. They're saved by the blood. So Moses was saved by Jesus Christ. Right? But in, in history, that payment isn't made till later. But because he's trusting in the promise, God applies retroactively. He applies that blood to, to the son. Does that? Yeah? Okay. Ron? How could they have faith without the Holy Spirit? Uh, well, I don't think they could. I don't think they did. Correct. That's right. Yeah. No. There's. There. I would say they're saved exactly the same we, same way we are by grace through faith in Christ, um, and it's the Holy Spirit who gave them that gift of faith. 
what we don't have is a clear description. There's not a lot of information about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but it doesn't mean he was inactive. Right? He was there. He was giving these people faith. He was opening eyes. Um, but we don't have a full picture of him until the New Testament. But he is there, right, in, um, oh, I forget which chapter it is. But uh, Aholiab and, what's the other guy? I think it's in Exodus 31. The two craftsmen are, are endowed with the Holy Spirit to, to make the temple or to make the ark and the, the tabernacle beautiful. So there's, there's hints of the Spirit's action even in the Old Testament. But he doesn't really come into clear focus until, really until Pentecost. But I would say they were saved exactly the way we are. And it was the Holy Spirit who would have had to give them, who would have had to give them that faith. I don't think they could muster it up on their own any better than we can. Um, perhaps another way to put it, if we move a little closer to the timeline of the New Testament... I think we've discussed this here. Yeah, and I'll throw it out as a question. Who was the last Old Testament prophet? John the Baptist. Yeah. And John the Baptist was regenerated when? In the womb. John the Baptist was born again before his mother gave birth to him. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and it could have been for Moses that it happened at age 40, right, when he was called. It could have happened for David, who knows when. Uh, but these men would have had to be regenerated the same way me and you are. I don't see another way of salvation other than by grace through faith. And the by grace part means the Holy Spirit plants that faith there. right? Um, but it's like, well, even let's say our doctrine of the afterlife comes mostly in the New Testament. It's not that it's not there in the Old Testament. It's just It comes into sharper focus in the New Testament. But the reality is the same in the Old Testament just how much we know about it or how much is written about it. Unless I'm not understanding what you're, what you're saying there. I'm not suggesting they're saved by their bootstraps. <laughs> so. Why the distinction? So Keith's asking, why the distinction? You're asking, why do we learn more about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? And he's kind of in the background and in the shadows in the Old Testament. I'd say probably for the same reason that Christ is in the shadows in the Old Testament. Right? The second person of the Trinity is there all along, uh, but he's in the shadows until it's time. And, and I think the closest we could probably get to an answer is in Galatians where it talks about it. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Well, why now? I, I don't know. God knows why it was time now. God knows why it's time at Pentecost to send the Holy Spirit in an explicit way that it wasn't fitting to send him before that. Uh, not that he wasn't operative. He was. But to draw attention to him, why wait till Pentecost? I don't know. Why wait till... Uh, till the incarnation to draw attention to Christ. I, I'm not sure. Maybe someone's got a better answer. I, I would say that's just God's purposes in working out history over time. But why now and not 100 years earlier or later or, or 2000? I, I don't have a good answer for that. Unless I'm misunderstanding or someone wants to add something to that. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Marina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's true. The, the one thing that's fitting about the Spirit here is that Christ is physically absent from us, right? So it's fitting that now would be the time to send the Helper. Right. In in terms of the 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 focus or the attention that's drawn on him and the explicit presence, but I think we would have to say that he is there in the shadows even beforehand, right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the deeps. 
right? Aholiab and someone tell, help me. What's the other craftsman? It's an, I think it's in Exodus 30. What's that? Yeah, Be- yes, yes. There we go. Bezalel and Aholiab. I think it's in Exodus 31. Doesn't matter. But, yeah, okay. Um, they're clearly supernaturally gifted with the Holy Spirit to do their work on the temple, or on the, not on the temple, on the, on the ark and on the, the tabernacle. So he's there, um, but somehow not in the same way, and again, I can't define this, somehow not in the same way that he is until Pentecost. Same as, is, you know, we talked last week about Christ being at the right hand of the Father. Has Christ always been the heir? Well, yes. But there's something about his ascension that he's there in a way that somehow wasn't like that before his ascension, right? There's a progress. There's the next step that's being, that's being taken. Um, and exactly how that plays out, you know, exactly where do these shifts take place sometimes is a little fuzzy. I don't know if you are here last week. I, to me, marriage analogies always help here. When is a couple married? When are they married? That, that's one step. What if they never consummate their vows? There's been no one flesh union. They're not in, in one, right? It, who knows? And do we need to know exactly? That's where it starts. And we're dealing with events that are so close in time to each other. You know, from Christ's resurrection to his ascension is 40 days, and there's only another nine days for Pentecost. So we're dealing with seven weeks here. Like, it's not... (laughs) This far after the fact, I don't... I don't know exactly how it plays out. So in some sense, I can't answer it. But in the progress of redemption, there must be something that is true in a way after the event that it wasn't beforehand. And, and I don't have words or thoughts to, to really describe it better than that. But I do believe the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament, just operating in the shadows. The, the pre, like the glory cloud. Yes. Yeah, and that could very well be... A manifestation of the Spirit, yeah. Yep. Anything else on this? <laughs> yes. When you're converted, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I'm assuming that question is in reference to some of the claims from our charismatic friends, that there's an extra baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. So baptism by the Holy Spirit, I think, is uh, synonymous with your regeneration. You're given the gift of the Holy Spirit so that your blinders fall off. You've got eyes to see Scripture. You've got ears to listen to Scripture. You've got a heart that's willing to obey. Everything about you is, is new. And I think that happened the same way for Abraham and Moses and David, in that sense. The difference is you understand better what happened to you than they did. But I do believe that they possess the Spirit of God, right? Uh, I, I do believe that. And if, you, well, you're maybe not talking about current claims about once you're really a Christian, then you'll start speaking in tongues or that kind of stuff. That's not what you're going after. Yeah, okay. Okay. Then, then we'll leave that be. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's correct, yeah. No, I think that's a totally legitimate application. Uh, Well, I'd say John the Baptist. I would say, based on the language, I think uh, David was. 
I do think Bezalel and Aholiab were. Um, the difference is, so Alfred's making application to the temple veil being torn, which is a significant event, right? Because in the Old Testament, symbolically, God's presence was tied to a place, right? God was in the ark, or God was in the tabernacle, or God was in the temple, the Holy of Holies, right? And the veil, the curtain, is what separated the priests from the Holy of Holies, right? Uh, and so I think the significance of that tearing is that that dividing wall, that there's this special class of priests is now over. Christ is our final high priest. There's direct access to God. I think that's symbolically what's happening with the, t- with the curtain being torn. We don't need these intermediaries now. Christ is, is explicitly it. We have direct access to the Holy of Holies. We have direct access to God through Christ. And so all these steps, why would, we need, why would we need that temple? Why would we need that curtain at this point? Because we have the substance now, right? And so the types and shadows slowly but surely fall away as Christ is fulfilling them in his ministry. So I think that's a perfectly good application. And at Pentecost, the spirit is made so visible and so explicit that there's no, no denying it. Just like the temple curtain being torn We need these visual things to help us see, okay, something's different. God's economy has moved to the next step now, right? Um, But I still think the reality, in some sense, in a shadowy sense, I do think that the reality existed in some sense in the Old Testament. But, But the substance has arrived now. I believe Moses was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, depends. <laughs> depends who Melchizedek is. <laughs> if Melchizedek is just a guy, then it would seem that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If he was Christ, then, then, <laughs> then, then the question answers itself. Yeah. Yeah, Saul, interestingly, interestingly, Saul was enabled by the Holy Spirit to rule, right? Um, And that leads to an interesting question. Was the gifting of the Holy Spirit that Saul got, was it regeneration? I.e., are we going to see Saul in heaven? Or was it just an enabling to help him with his earthly tasks, but it wasn't a regenerating work of the spirit and there's an interesting conversation around that that I'll be happy one way or the other once I get to heaven but yeah I, I don't know if Saul was regenerate or not but there, there is explicit language about Saul being filled with the Holy Spirit yeah Yeah, and that's, so those who hold that Saul was not regenerate would say that the giving of the Holy Spirit to Saul was just for the task of leading Israel for a season. The same way we could say Judas had the Holy Spirit, not in a saving sense, but to enable him to to walk for so and so far. And in one sense... You know, we, we see lots of evil in the world around us. But think of how this world would look if there was no restraining hand of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of unbelievers every day. Okay? Even Hitler and Stalin were being restrained by the Holy Spirit. They could have, all of them could have added one or two more zeros to their death count. Okay? So the Holy Spirit is restraining evil actively at all times in the world. This world could be much, much worse than it is. So... Some would understand Saul being given the Holy Spirit as just restraining his evil for a season to, for the you know, purpose of, of history that Israel needed to take. Um, and some would say, no, he was regenerate. He had the Holy Spirit in a saving sense. Um, and we're going to see him in heaven with a bunch of other corrupt people. What's that? 
And that's why some would say it wasn't a saving gifting of the Holy Spirit. It was a temporary thing. And there's harder language about Saul yet. An evil spirit from God tormented him. Okay, think, whoa, whoa, what? An evil spirit from where? From God. God sent an evil spirit into Saul. Okay, somehow your view of God's sovereignty has to be okay with God sending an evil spirit into Saul. What is that? I'm not sure. Vern. So how do you read that? Was Saul or are you gonna are you gonna see Saul in heaven? <laughs> I know it's not your call. What are you expecting? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, it's there, but it's shadowy. I'll grant, just like our doctrine of the afterlife, it's there in the Old Testament, but it's very shadowy, right? And and what Paul says, we see through a a glass dimly, right? We see much clearer. Think of, you know, turning on your mag light, and you're kind of turning, twisting it, and it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. That's redemptive history. Things come better and better into view, sharper and sharper into focus as we move along. Yes. Okay, there's a pastoral question. Okay, no, this is, this is good. I was taught the same thing. I clearly remember my dear, sweet Sunday school teacher who told me there's no way back from suicide. Suicide equals hell. Okay, this is pastoral. This isn't just theology. It is theology. Lisa's asking about those who commit suicide. And there's actually three parallel accounts of Saul's death. And again, this goes into God's sovereignty. Saul impaled himself on his sword. His armor bearer impales himself on, impales Saul on his sword. And God killed Saul. So which one is it? Saul pierced himself with the sword. His armor bearer pierced him with the sword. And God killed Saul. It's the same thing. Saul, through his agency, commissioned someone to kill him. Saul killed himself by his own order. Someone runs a sword through him. And who is writing every last detail of that story? God. God did kill Saul. God killed Saul with a sword. God killed Saul with Saul's own sword. God killed Saul with Saul's own sword through his armor bearer being commissioned by Saul to do it. It's all true. And again, when we think about God's sovereign actions in history, you have to see that God killed Saul and Saul killed himself and not see any contradiction or difficulty there. It's the same event. So that touches on God's sovereignty. But what about suicide? Here's how I was taught... And here's how I gather some of you others were taught. That in the act of suicide, if the action is successful, there's no chance to repent afterward. And so those people who kill themselves, there's no, there's no chance of redemption. It's a direct ticket. You're getting your ticket punched directly to hell because there's no, uh, there's no chance of repenting of that sin afterward. Who was taught that view or something like it? Okay. Is suicide a grave sin? Yeah. Is it a violation of the fifth commandment? Sixth commandment? Yeah. It's serious business. It's murder. It's self-murder. Okay. Now... Let's think of Christ's atoning work. We've just said he, had, he satisfies perfectly. So, let's take a truly regenerate, born-again saint. Are there past sins atoned for? Yeah. Are there sins today atoned for? 
Are your sins next week atoned for? Yep. Your future sins are atoned for by Christ if you are a believer. And at the moment of your conversion, all your sins were future to you. And they're all forgiven in that act of conversion. All of them. Suicide, as I understand it, is not a direct ticket to hell. It is a serious, serious sin. But there's going to be other serious sinners in heaven. There's going to be murderers in heaven. There's going to be adulterers in heaven. There's going to be con artists in heaven. Okay? There's going to be effeminate mama's boys in heaven. And I'm just going through our list of saints in the Old Testament. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the good people yet. Okay? There's going to be a motley crew of bad people whose sins are forgiven in heaven. Including people who killed themselves. And by saying that, I'm not saying Saul is or isn't. I'm happy with whatever God's determination on that is. But if repentance means that we have to consciously remember every sin we've committed and repent of it by name before God, that's an impossible task. I don't know if I stole a Kit Kat from Solo and Landmark when I was four and I don't remember it. Is that sin enough to damn me? Yes, it is. Do I need to remember and catalog verbally to God every sin for it to be forgiven? Repentance isn't just for our sins, it's for our sin. There's a whole change in nature. And redemption is accomplished completely to the whole person in the moment of conversion. So I do believe future sins are forgiven at the moment of conversion. And I believe... Genuine born-again people can be so tormented in their soul that they can commit this sin. And if they are truly Christians, that sin was forgiven 2,000 years ago. I truly believe that. This is pastoral stuff. And I don't envy anyone who has to preach a suicide funeral. Because suicide is not a good sign of what was happening in someone's heart just like adultery. Is God's grace big enough to forgive this? Yeah. It is. It is. And so is adultery. And so is cheating on your taxes. And lying. And gossip. Every time we sin, in the moment of that sin, we're saying, I know better than God. I am allowed to commit cosmic treason. That's what we're saying every time we sin. And yes, suicide is a gross exaggeration of that, that's true. But think of the alternative. If we have to name every sin by name after the fact to be forgiven, it starts to turn into works salvation pretty quick. And who of us in this room remembers every sin you've ever committed and have mentioned it explicitly by name in prayer? Probably not one of us. Okay. That would <laughs> I wouldn't make it here this morning if that was the case. Okay? And I'm not making light of suicide at all. It's serious. A few weeks ago, I talked about William Cooper, the, the hymn writer, the poet, who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood. That man tried three times to kill himself. As a born-again saint who just struggled deeply in his soul. Had he been successful, I'd say by God's mercy, he wasn't. Had he been successful, I expect William Cooper would be with his friend, uh, John Newton in heaven. I do believe that. Jolyn.
No, so Jolene, if you didn't hear, Jolene's just mentioning on the pastoral side. It's more, and I don't think you're saying God gives a pass to sin, but the sin is more understandable when people are in intense trauma. And I've shared here, I've got nothing to hide. I've been depressed to the point where I have been disappointed when I've woken up in the morning. I've never planned my suicide. But I have been deeply regretful that I woke up in the morning. I know that feeling. And I know the feeling of that feeling being there before my brain even has time to turn on and start thinking. (laughs) Those thoughts are just there. You wake up and you're just in a cloud of self-hate and hopelessness. It's not a good feeling. And I expect others know that feeling as well. And it doesn't make the sin okay, but it does make it more understandable. And the basis here isn't anything other than the grace of Christ. Christ atones perfectly. If he is atoning for your sin, if he died for your sin, that means past sins, present sins, future sins. Vern. Amen. Amen. Yep. Is grace amazing to you? Is grace amazing to you? Anything else? I'm debating whether we keep going or whether that's a good place to end it. What say ye? Do we extend our coffee time? Let's pray. Father God, you are good. You are kind, you are long-suffering, and you are gracious. Lord, I thank you for the fact that grace isn't just nice, but that it's truly amazing. It's radical. It's as extreme as the problem is. Lord, and I pray that each one here this morning would be touched by your amazing, life-giving grace. And even for those of us who already have been touched by it, who know it, I pray that you would press it deeper into the corners of our hearts, that we would have eyes to see that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, I pray for those who are in dark seasons of their soul right now, who are troubled, tormented, or who know people who are tormented in their souls right now. Lord, I pray that you would bring peace and I pray that we would be messengers of your life-changing grace. Lord, I pray that all of us would see that grace is not something that just tops up our efforts, but something that is at the bottom of everything, empowering all of it. Lord, and when we think about you atoning perfectly, interceding perfectly for past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. Lord, I pray that we would be transformed by that knowledge, that that grace would grip us deeply in every part of our life, and that it would fuel lives of gratitude. Lord, I pray that blessing on each one this morning, and as we discuss your Holy Spirit, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch each one this morning, make us receptive to your word, Lord, help us to understand your word better and empower lives of gratitude, lives of holy living, but of thanks for what you have done. Commit this group and this morning into your hands. Lord, thank you for your kindness to us, and we pray this all in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.